we've got Bifrost, we've started Bifrost, we've made sure that Bifrost is the right version, which is great. We're, we're ready to go. What on earth is this thing? Well, it's a visual programming framework for 3D graphics. That's literally what it is. It is a programming language. What it gives you is proceduralism in Maya. So it is a fully non-destructive, absolutely complete programming language. You can make anything you like in Bifrost. Some things are not uh, sensible to make in Bifrost. I wouldn't try and code my own version of Fortnite, for example, but it's possible. So it is a fully featured programming language. Sounds scary, right? It isn't really. The biggest thing you have to remember from, from the very beginning, from moving forward from right now, is that Bifrost deals in data. That's all it is. Just like other procedural programs out there, it is manipulating data that you give to it. So, so let's have a look at something really, really simple. First thing you probably want to do is create a graph. So you can create a graph here, or you can go up here and go new graph. That works too. Something to mention straight away is that your graphs will show up in your outliner. Now, there's nothing going on here right now. We'll get to that. These are what hooks Bifrost into Maya. You'll see as we progress that I'll be doing some things in the outliner, some things in the node editor, most things in Bifrost. But this is the Maya object from the Bifrost graph. So you do tend to have the outliner, the viewport, and your Bifrost graph open. Although you want the real estate, you can close down the outliner. So something really simple. Some rules before we start, like how to use Bifrost, not, not so much what Bifrost does, but how to use it. Bifrost goes from left to right. Okay, um, just change that back to the default. So normally you have things here, you do things to them, and then you output them here. That's how this graph works. You put an input and an output. You have these things called ports. Now, these guys are compounds. These guys are ports. As we'll see in just a minute, the ports are color coded. Uh, their shapes matter. And we'll talk about hats in a minute. So like I said, let's do something super simple. I'm going to go into Maya, I'm going to create a sphere. Now this is a Maya sphere. It is a Maya object. I can go to the channel box here. I can change things like its scale or its radius. Let's change its radius. Let's give it some subdivisions. So we'll go up to 60, so it's a little bit higher resolution. But this right now is not a Bifrost object. This is a Maya object, it's a Maya sphere. Just like you, you know, if you've used Maya before or any other DCC, it is a piece of geometry in that program. I can do all of the Maya things with it. I can move it and scale it and even rotate it for a bit of fancy, which is cool. If I want to do something to this sphere, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into Bifrost. And the easiest way to bring something into Bifrost is select it in the outliner, middle click, drag it in. Your sphere exists in Maya and is now linked into your Bifrost graph. If I hide the sphere, we all know the sphere is still there, it's hidden. But I have a link to it in Bifrost. If I take, just click once on the mesh port and take it out to the output port, my sphere comes back. So this is now the sphere inside this Bifrost graph. And there is a link. So if I take the sphere and scale it, you see we're not looking at the Maya sphere right now, we're looking at the Bifrost graph. This all passes through. So transforms come through, which is, is great and something you need to remember. A lot of times you will get mixed up. So I would recommend that when you're bringing geometry in, once it's in, hide it. That way it'll be a lot less confusing. So as you can see, we have a sphere on the left with a connection here going off to the output. You see this port connection here, the default in input port, that is a green color. These guys are blue. That's what that's telling us is that this is a float port and this is a object port. And you can check these by right clicking port type object, port type float. You have different types that you can, you can apply. You can change the port type depending on what you're doing. We're going to be doing a lot of that. So I'm just going to push forward and, and hopefully you guys can pick it up. So we go from left to right. Let's do something to the sphere. What, what's something easy we can do to the sphere? Well, probably the very first node that it's really good to know about is the pass node. If you didn't catch what I did there, I was on my backdrop, I hit tab. 
then I typed in pass. You get a big old list of nodes with the word pass in it, or PSS, or PSS there as well, or PASS there. This is how you add nodes in Bifrost. You, there's several ways to do it. You can, if I just hit tab, I've got a menu here. I can go through every single node in the world, or I can look inside of these categories. So these are the core nodes, the diagnostic nodes, the file nodes, all of that kind of thing. So if you wanted to read an Alembic, there's read Alembic, it's on the file. Or you could just type in read, read Alembic will be in here. There we go. So that's how you get nodes in. And what a pass node does is nothing. It literally takes what's coming in and passes it out. What it's useful for is keeping your graphs tidy. So let's do something really, really simple with this with this sphere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get point position. So I can type TPP and it'll be in the list. I can type G Popo and it'll be there. I can type the whole thing out. Oops. Without uh, you know, without making mistakes, would be good. Many many ways to do it. You can also come to the list of compounds and find it. So if you go to geometry, properties, there it is. There, get point position. So what this will do is give me all of the point positions on the sphere, which is what I want. I can also connect in many different ways. I can drag out and just connect that way. I can hold down Alt and connect here, but this won't work because we're changing our style. What I can also do, which is very good to start with, if I just click once and pull out an empty connection, tab, get point position. Just go down here, and this will auto connect for me. So what we're doing here is we're getting the position of the points. This brings us into our next point, which is we have an object coming in and we have something else coming out. We're not quite sure what that is at this point because it doesn't look like any of the ports we've seen before. What this is is an array. It's an array of positions. So an array is just a big list in a specific order. It doesn't even have to be in a specific order, but the order is important inside Bifrost. This is a big list of our positions. So. I can, for example, output that list right there. You don't see anything change. The data is now coming from the Meyer object into the Bifrost graph. The position array is being captured and then it's being output, which we can have a look at in Meyer as well. So if we go to the node editor and just drag our Bifrost graph in, we want the shape. If you come and have a look at some of the outputs, you can see here point position and it's an array of positions. So that's data input output from Maya to Bifrost and back out again. You can now, in whatever you're building, use these positions if you want to. There's port one, which is the one that we just left on, and mesh will be in here somewhere too, mesh one as well. So there's the mesh coming up. So that's how Bifrost talks to Maya and Maya talks to Bifrost. So why don't we do something with these positions? So I'm just going to delete this pass name for now. I've still got my mesh going out. I'm still seeing my mesh, but I'm not seeing the position. That's okay. I know they're there. Something else you'll need to know on Bifrost is how do I see that data? Right now, there's no data visualizer or a data spreadsheet or anything else you might be used to, but we do have this thing called watch points. If you add a watch point, what this is telling me straight away that is this is an array with 3,542 entries in the array that starts at minus 10, minus 10, minus 10, and finishes at 10, 10, 10 which makes a bunch of sense because our sphere is a sphere of radius 10 and it has, I think, what did I say, 60 by 60 divisions in it. So that's watch points. Watch points are very, very handy. Let's do something with this position. So if I just say, add something to this position. So this is a probably one of the simplest nodes. It adds two things together. At this, at this point, if we're putting in an array, it's going to add something to everything in that array. If I put another array in here, it's going to try and add those two arrays together. And if those arrays are different sizes, you will get interesting results. But that's not what I'm using it for. What I'm using it for is to show you this. You see the plus here? What the plus will do is if I right click on that, I can create a value node. 
And this creates a node going into the add that is of the same type. So this is a float three, I'll then pass node for that. If I hold my mouse over there, you can see at the bottom, a little yellow bar that says output inferred type array math float three. It, it's an array. You can tell it's an array because the output looks like a hat. I wasn't kidding about the hats. You can see this, this is a little square. This is a little hat. The hat says I'm an array. This is a single vector. And like all vectors, x, y, and z. And I maybe want to add, say, let's go five in the y. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking this whole array, I'm adding five in the y. I can output this to here and nothing's gonna happen. Here's another way to add compounds. If you have an existing connection, select the connection. I'm going to set point position, which is absolutely what it says it is. It is setting the point positions of the geometry with these positions. Right now, there's nothing in there. That is an empty array. So my sphere has disappeared because Meyer and Bifrost don't know where those positions are. I can reproduce exactly the same sphere by doing this. So I'm just getting the point position and setting the point position. And once more, I can put a watch point on here. I'll get the same information. I can break that connection by just pulling it like that. Or if you hold down on Windows anyway, Control, Shift and Alt, you can cut that connection. But I don't want to just put it in and bring it out again. I, I don't need to don't need to do that one. So I can just replace what's going into here with this addition and my entire sphere moves up. So I'm just going to delete that port. I'm taking all of the positions of the sphere. I'm adding 0, 050 0 to those positions and then I am setting those point positions on the sphere. So this has the effect of moving every single thing in this array up by five units. I can also click on this number and I am left clicking on that. That's what's called a virtual slider. So I can do this, I can do that, all kinds of good stuff. What I really wanted to show with this one is that Bifrost is non-destructive. It's procedural and non-destructive. So no matter what you do after the sphere node, the sphere node is still intact. If I take this and I just plug it straight in, you can see my original spheres come back. Things to take away from this early chapter is that Bifrost works from left to right. Bifrost works on data and that data has types. This color means it's a float three, otherwise known as a three point vector. If you wanted to check out the basic data types in Bifrost, you can just put down the other very basic node, which is a value node. So we'll put down a value node. And this is just literally a variable. It's a number. It, it, it can be a string, it can be whatever you like because this is a bit of data that you're generating to pop into Bifrost. It's what I did here by right clicking and going create value node. This is the value node. If you click the ellipsis here, the three dots, you can set the type of that. And you can see here are the simple data types. So we have integers, floating points, booleans, strings, objects, and f-curves. And they can also be an array that is a 1D, 2D, or 3D array. Awesome. You have vector types. So at this point, this is set to a vector four. If I set it to a vector three, that's our XYZ, that's our RGB, that's a vector three. Just like any other DCC, that is a vector. You can choose what's in the vector, if it's an integer, if it's unsigned integer, if it's a floating point of what bit depth, all of that kind of thing. And the other cool thing to look at is, is down here on the interface for the value node is what type it is. So this is the type of data. So if I go here, it's going to be a long integer. It's going to be an unsigned long integer. Or if I go to string, it's a string. An object, an F curve, a boolean. Floating point of different flavors, so a double or a float. You also have matrices, uh, four by four, or two by two, or two by four, if you're feeling fancy. And they can be a integer matrix, it could be a floating point matrix, it could be unsigned. You have various other cool stuff here, enums, customs, and any type, but we'll get to that later. So have a poke around here, have a poke around here, look at the data types, get your head around that. But you notice if I change this, my port changes. So this is now a string, and you can check what the port is by hovering over it, output type string, input, oh, sorry, value type string, value zero. So for the value node, I can change it here. Let's change it to a boolean. 
turns orange and it's telling you it's a bull. Okay, so that's data types. Pretty easy. Once you've got the data, you can manipulate it. And that, that's the power of Bifrost.